the total stack in the gray. So I will give you just two examples of how in the lab we use quantitative imaging to uh, quantify the two different properties of cells. So one of the cell nucleus, that is exactly what we are interested in. One is nuclear polarity, and the other example is uh, um, uh, nuclear size. Essentially, we, we develop technique to measure nuclear polarity, and to test if it exists, and uh, we develop more recently a technique to uh, measure the nuclear, nuclear volume. So, as I told you many times, I'm a physicist and I am interested in the nucleus, but not exactly this one. This one, the cell nucleus, that as you know, is the biggest organ of the cell, it's the one that uh, contains the genetic material and is, uh, um, is defined by a double B layer that is the nuclear envelope. It's interesting to notice, as Ben showed perfectly in the two talks before, that there is total continuity between the nuclear envelope and the ER. That will be interesting later too. It's known that in different diseases, and cancer is one of them, one of the most important transformations is that it doesn't matter how you become a cancer, but uh, there is a huge transformation of both the, the um, cytoskeletal organization of the cell and also how the nucleus change. As well, it's known that the nucleus is not isolated, so the nucleus is connected to the rest of the cell, thanks to the complex and other elements, and it reacts to mechanical stimuli coming from the subscale and the nuclear and the cell microenvironment. So what is known for many, many years is that cells are polarized. So essentially, many cells display an asymmetric distribution of elements. This asymmetric distribution of elements is asymmetric distribution of protein, but also asymmetric distribution of function. And in a mainly migrating cell, you can distinguish a clear front and a clear back. And that is what is called cell polarity. As I told you before, there is a connection between uh, the cytoskeleton and uh, the nucleus. And this, that is thanks to the link complex that is a plethora of elements that connect elements of the cytoskeleton, like microtubule, and you know, an intermediate filament, together with the inner side of the nucleus. But what was totally not known if part of the polarity of the cell is somehow transmitted to the nucleus. So when we talk of cell polarity, can we talk also about something like nuclear polarity? And that is our hypothesis, and that is what we test in the last years. I don't know if you know, but you can play with the geometry of the cell. So you can force the cell to acquire the shape you want. So if you want a, a disc cell, you can force the cell to be a disc. If you want a square, an hexagon, a pentagon, or a three drop. So essentially, you can force the cell to acquire the shape you want. And that will uh, simplify a lot your, your work. In our case, we want polarized cells. So we want a front and a back. Better, a clear front and a clear back. A system that works quite well is line, because in line, first, the cell moves, so it's a real polarization, not a frustrated one. And then, as you can see here, there is a clear front, clear back, clear front, clear back. So essentially, line are a fantastic source of a population of cells that are clearly polarized. So what we did is that we put cell, in this case, RP1 cell, online. Online, they are very well polarized. We localize the Golgi. Here, we use the Golgi just as a marker of polarity. So the cell go where the, the Golgi is. So the Golgi is always on the front. And then what we did, OK, we have many cells in our line, one, two, three. We identify the cells. Then what we did is just to cut it out from the field of view. We orient in a way that the Golgi is always on the front. And then we register it. So essentially, we register all the nuclei in order to be able to overimpose. Why we did all that? Essentially, the principle is like to do an average, but an average of image. So as you know, you average number, and that is quite easy. But average image is a bit more complex, because the shape of the cell will be always different. So it's not possible to overimpose. And that's we solved thanks to the line. Because one time in the line, then the shape of the cell is always the same. They are on the line. And then we register for the position of the Golgi. So then the Golgi overlap one on top of the other. And then we just adjust by a registration. That's allow us to generate this kind of statistical map. So this is an average localization of the nucleus. This is average localization of the Golgi. And this is trivial, because I told you before that we orient the cell in front of the Golgi. So clearly, the Golgi is in the front. Indeed, what <laughs> only matters here is the M-talk. 
then talk localized close to the Golgi between the Golgi and the nuclides. That is just to show that our system is kind of working. Then, just to stress a concept of the last days, you can give any color to your picture, but what matter is that you provide a scale. So, then, there are few proteins that are known to span on both sides of the, of the nuclear envelope, and that's what we say is that we want to test if there is the possibility that part of the polarity of the cytoskeleton is somehow transmitted at the nucleus, at the nuclear envelope, and maybe on the inner side. So one of these few proteins is amyrin, and so what we did, thanks also to electron microscopy done with uh, Sasha Mironov and Galina at, uh, at iPhone, is to test exactly where is localized amyrin. So this is an immunogold for amyrin, and then you can see that clearly you find a both sides of the nuclear envelope. And what we did next, we test if there is any bias of amyrin in function of the polarity of the cell. And what we found is that amyrin is preferentially at the front of the cell. So one time you have your cell moving on the line, and then we do an average for many, many cells here, it's 100 something. Then you find an enrichment of amyrin just on the direction of the front, so where the Golgi is. The point is the only one, no, it's the, not only one. Also other protein like lamin B, lamin AC, present a bias toward the front, it is statistically significant. And then, you know, you have a new toy, the first stuff you do, you break it. So now we know that in RP1, we have this kind of localization, and when we say, okay, what happened to the cell when we remove amyrin? So first of all, it's interesting to notice that amyrin is a small protein of the nuclear envelope, but when you remove, you have a huge change in the organization of the cell. So, but in this case, the cell look like a bit much more contractile, we can say, but with the distribution of the Golgi and of them top, that is much more uh, spread. As it was already uh, um, reported in the past, uh, one of the main uh, phenotypes in uh, amyrin knockdown cell, or any SI, is the fact that the distance between the top and the nucleus increase. And then I just told you, not only in the nucleus, but also in the, in the cytoplasm, you have huge change. That is the distribution of attacking or vinculin. And that's, you see, how uh, they are dramatically different. Now then come back to what we are interested. So then uh, we look at distribution of protein like lamin D or lamin AC, and we see that lamin D essentially doesn't change when we remove anything from the system, lamin AC dramatically does. Then we look at protein of the link complex, so the, 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 um, the set of proteins that meet in the cytoskeleton with the nucleus, and then also in this case we found interesting stuff. So there are proteins that are not biased, first of all. Not all the proteins inside the nucleus or the nuclear are biased, some are and some not. And so, again, change when you remove anything, Something doesn't change when you remove an end, sorry, and some change dramatically. In this case, we have a kind of gain of function. So the protein seems to be mainly localized at the center of the nucleus in presence of family, and when you remove family, bam, it seems to take another function and go to the front. Again, this is just to give you examples. So there are other proteins of the link complex, some are infected, some are, are not affected. And then we decide, okay, up to now we look at elements that stay at the boundary, so they are at the nuclear envelope, but what's happening if we go a bit in, in the nucleus? It's known that chromosomes have kind of uh, um, preferential localization inside the nucleus. Some are more peripheral, some are more center, and uh, uh, typically they don't mix all the time. And also it's known <coughs> that this localization is dramatically perturbed on cancer cells. And so we went and we say, okay, let's see if also chromosomes have specific localization inside the nucleus when it's polarized. And uh, <coughs> we have to say that for the majority of the chromosomes that we test, we found no a statistical bias. We found a statistical bias for chromosome 3 and also change upon amyrin removal. It's true that this distribution is not statistically significant, but neither is random. So that is about the interpretation of your result. And then, uh, okay, other chromosomes like the small one are mainly in the center, and the majority of them are not affected when we remove energy from the system. Then we look at other elements inside the nucleus, yeah, like could be uh, nuclear actin that we found uh, strongly biased toward the front, and this bias changed when we remove energy, or a RNA pole that seems not to be biased, is at the two pole and their state. Or we look at elements like uh, uh, constitutive and facultative heterochromatin, mm -hmm. and also in this case we find that some is affected by amyrin removal, some are not affected, some, and some are chromatically affected. And then we look at the part of chromatin that interact directly with amyrin, that can be a bit trivial. Essentially, we use these constructs from the Bassmann Census lab, 
that is able to visualize the part of chromatin that interact with a specific protein. They did in the past for lamin, so they look at the chromatin interacting with lamin. We did a very similar approach thanks to their construct, and we look at the chromatin interacting with temeri. And the result, we can say, is a bit trivial, because of course, if the protein is biased, also the part of chromatin can interact with it, it's biased too. Then we have a summary. Okay, first of all, remember, we start with cell, we polarize, that's a strongly polarized cell. I can tell you that also if we don't put the cell online and we just segment cells that stay in 2D and we orient for the Golgi, the majority of the results are replicated. Maybe a, a bit less strong bias, but the bias is still there. So we found that uh, when the cells are polarized, emerin is polarized too, lamin is polarized, and then I stress this concept again, doesn't mean that all the proteins on the nuclear angle are polarized. Indeed, like protein like SAN1 are not. And again, if we move inside, we found one chromosome that is polarized toward the front, chromosome 3, but that is not true for all the chromosomes, and there are other that are not biased. So, first conclusion is true. Kind of polarity in the nucleus exists, that is not true for all. Second, now we remove emery. And what we found is, it's okay, the polarity <coughs> at the nuclear angle of some element like lamine C depends on emery. <coughs> so if you remove emery, then you have a huge change. And that's, again, it's not true for all. Other protein doesn't change their distribution. Other, like SAN2, have a kind of gain of function, that is cool, and that is true also for the chromosome. Chromosome 3, that is the one that we found a bit biased, changes localization, but chromosome 9 doesn't change its localization. Not polarized and not polarized. And that's its first part of conclusion. But then, how this polarity is born? So again, we focus on emerging, and what we notice, how it was reported by Lindy Schwarz many years before, Emerin seems to move from the ER and then from the ER reach the nuclear angle. And then we say, it's okay, but then where the ER is. And then we did our approach also looking at the distribution of the ER, and we found that the ER is mainly localized at the front of the cell, the majority of the time. So like the Golgi, also the ER stays on the front. And let's allow us to be, <coughs> okay, that's what we will see, that is what we often do we build minimal physical model. So with minimal physical model means that we don't want to stress and say that that is how it works, but uh, the point of this minimal model is uh, that uh, there are a, a very few amount, a very few elements can justify or can, um, can reproduce this phenomenon. And here we focus just on the fact that the ER is in the front, that uh, a protein will diffuse freedom in the ER, reach the nuclear envelope and bound to it. So here we introduce the fact that you have a reservoir of protein just in the front, because emery is in the art. The art can stay in the front and in the back. But there is much more in the front respect to what is in the back. Then we assume that the protein can freely fuse inside the art, but when it touches the nuclear envelope, then it's bound and will not move anymore. So here we have very few elements. So ER in the front, diffusion in the art, bound into the nuclear envelope. And then we develop, again, a minimum model, that is the concept, and we make simulation, and then what we notice is that this is sufficient. So just these few elements are sufficient to generate a bias. So not true, or it could be that other, other, other mechanism could explain the same phenomena, but that is sufficient to have this result. We know that the reality is much more complex, because proteins that are very similar to emerin can have a distribution on the other side, so like lap 2 alpha lap 2 alpha is a protein almost identical to emery, but instead to be biased to the front, it's biased to the back. Probably there is a flip-flop, so for sure there is much more element than what we depict here, but just to say that few elements can justify the phenotype. And then, for what is known emery, emery is known to be involved in emery directus muscular dystrophy, that is the dystrophy that uh, um, essentially uh, drive muscle loss. So it affects uh, muscle cells, and this patient, respect to other um, dystrophy, are kind of fine up to the age of 18, and then start to have the first symptoms, and then they die a bit early. But the disease is not severe as much other involving the calendar of protein. Now, first, we use uh, uh, primary bioblast from uh, healthy donor or from NDMD patient. And first, 
we were very happy to notice that uh, in the patient cell we can recapitulate what we see with SI in the RP1 cell. So you have a kind of shortening of the back with an increase of contractility. The fact that uh, the, the, the gauge is more spread is also more evident. And then again, we have an higher distance of the end top to the nuclear end. That is reported here. Also in this case, again, when you compare distribution of cytoskeleton protein <laughs> like a fat in your then again, you find a very huge difference between uh, cells from the patient versus the cone. And then we start to notice also that uh, this cell has uh, a smaller focal adhesion. It means that essentially they exert less force on the substrate, so they pull less on the substrate. And then we look at distribution of proteins. So in now, this is not a cell, this is patient cell. So LT donor versus enrivirus patient. And uh, as you can see, some of uh, um, the distribution are changing between LT patient and so LT donor and patients. But again, that is not true for all. So my father problem is not biased. If you have good memory, you will remember that in RP1, some of the distribution of this protein was totally different, and that is fine. So difference aligned can have different organization of the cytoskeleton, and as well, this can be reflected with different bias inside the nucleus. We were not particularly surprised. And again, the concept is the same. Some of the protein can change, some will not. I will focus on Nespring 1 a bit uh, because Nespring 1 is uh, one of the proteins that is connecting the nucleus with the cytoskeleton and is known to be one of the main characters of energy. So I make you focus here because later it will become important. And again, so Sun 1 changes localization but also Nespring 1. Then we play exactly the same game and we look at different components inside the nucleus just to see how our map is react and if or not change in the patient versus the country. Heterochromatin, and now we come here. So now we know that in patient cell you have no emery. But what you can do, you can, uh, um, you can infect this cell with an emery GFP construct and make emery expressed in this cell line. So we, uh, we, we insert, we cannot insert back because this cell never expressed. We insert emery GFP inside this cell and then first we notice that the distribution of emery in GFP, so an exogenous second emery, inside the patient cell also localized toward the front of the cell. And what is interesting, you have a rescue on the uh, distance between uh, the nucleus and the TOC. So if you put emery in the system, then the distance between the nucleus and TOC shake. So the, the, the TOC come back closer to the nucleus, as in the control cell, not totally, but Closer. But then we were particularly happy. You remember in patient cell the localization of Nespring is lost, but then if you put emery in the system, the localization of Nespring comes back and is mainly again polarized toward the front. So we can have a second sum that is also in primary cells, in myoblast cells, so different kinds of spectral RP1, emery is still polarized toward the front. There are other cell, other uh, protein of the nuclear envelope that have specific uh, uh, localization, and this localization is not perturbed in the patient. While other protein like Nespring 1 have a strong bias toward the front, in the patient cell, this bias is lost. But if you put emery back in the system, this pathway is rescued, as well as rescue also the distance between the nucleus and the top. That is a final summary of this first part of the talk. And then we can say that it's okay, it looks like that this local polarity exists. So some of the elements of the nuclear envelope and maybe also some of the elements inside the cell are polarized when the cell is polarized too. So there is transmission of polarity between the cytoskeleton that is dramatically polarized and the nucleus. Emery in partial control it, so that I stress the partial because as I told you before, some of the localization change when we remove emery from the system, but that is not true for all. So Erin is not the master regulator or whatever. So there are other elements that play important role and not all is a work of family. Then I present you a minimal mathematical model. I insist on the concept that is a minimal mathematical model. We don't prove that that is the way it works, but we want to say that just diffusion and binding is sufficient to have this pentide. Doesn't mean that that is the way it works, 
but it means that few elements can justify this benefit. <coughs> and that is more on the side that I just cited. So there is something that link to contractility because we notice that this cell exerts less force to the substrate. So when you remove amylin somehow, the cells are less able to exert force. So we think that uh, the link in between uh, um, the nuclear envelope, emery, and polarity is something related to a state of the cell that is called uh, um, uh, tensegrity. So we cannot consider that all the elements inside the cell are separated, but they are all interconnected. And is a, wrong to say, retains a structure, but is a structure that stays in equilibrium also if there is tension inside. And that is the end of the first part. I can say that other people, thanks God, found very similar results. Um, in this case, uh, we come back to virus, and they found that one of these um, uh, the cytomegalovirus uh, induces a polarization of the nucleus. So it's known that it is generated one of these body for uh, viral replication, but what is cool that then it orients the nucleus in function of that, and one of the proteins that is found polarize at the border with the virus is entering again. So it seems that also in other systems where they induce a polarization, but this case is a viral induced polarization of the nucleus, also there is a polarization of the nuclear envelope, and in this case is entering again. So entering stay at the site of them top, where the <coughs> virus induced the polarization of the nucleus. Now it's up your choice. Or I pass to second part and we chat about size or you do question here. You have a question, please. <coughs> just for the, just the curiosity, the statistical method to see the difference between, like you change, you, com, you compare each pixel, because each pixel is an average, then the statistical significance. Thank you. I met you for the question. I have to say it's not a common <laughs> question. It's nice. So it took a while to develop a statistical method to, to put start here. And essentially what we did is a cumulative distribution. And then we compare the cumulative distribution of this probability toward the random one. So that is what we did. So essentially, when you see the start here, it means that it's not flat. Then we need one side or the other side in order to say if it's statistically biased to the front or to the back. It's like the test, left, right, or um, right, right. And, uh, uh, and then uh, sometimes it's just in the middle, and so you cannot distinguish between the two, but you know that in general it's not statistically significant. And then, so you apply the same with the other one. So in this case, you don't compare versus random, but you compare versus the other one. So in the first case, what's, what's your H0 hypothesis? What's your? Uniform. 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 So uniform distribution of Uniform distribution. Across. Yes. Uniform distribution. This is a sum projection. So when you see the edge, this edge doesn't mean that it's inside because it's a sum projection, so all the graph will come one. Whereas when you compare treatment versus control, you just compare the two distributions exactly. to each other. One versus the other. Just a curiosity. When you knock, knock down or knock out I marry, do, do the cell have a problem in uh, going uh, mitosis? I think? Good point. Uh, not really. And indeed, the patient is alive. So emery is not uh, is not a fundamental problem. So this patient, yes, they are not healthy, of course. There is a disease related to it, but they reach 45 years old. Up to 18, they have almost no symptoms. So it's a dispensable problem. So that is why also we insist it's not the master regulator of the So for sure, it helps. Have to be there. If you have, it's better. Yeah, you know that. Do you think this is a matter of redundancy of function? Please. Do you imagine that this is, do you think it's a matter of redundancy of functions? Uh, yeah, well, that's the step number two. So, um, uh, I have a partial question. Okay. So I have, no, uh, I have no full question about, uh, full answer about that, but I totally like the idea. 
Because then we have m in here, m in here. Is the function of the protein here and here the same? Is here a function or here is just a path to reach the function? So here it is doing a job, and I think yes, or it's just how to reach this place. I think the function of family is both. And then here we can say also something more uh, general, because now all the time the people speak about lean complex, they always draw that. And here they don't draw nothing. But this protein, the majority of the case, follow exactly the same path of family. And main interactor of family, again, is nestling one, that is drawed uh, for one. So then if uh, nest spring one and then they stay together also not at the nuclear angle but and yeah, which is the role of nest spring one in the yard when it's connected with energy. So I think that there is a lot to do. And again, I can just say if I will have the time and the force to do sorry guy. But that's is probably the answer finally to your question. So there is something more that is distributed. Stoneman. Yeah, uh, Paolo, I have actually a more generic question. Have you tried to see whether, uh, you know, reorganization of uh, nucleus, okay, induced by uh, you know suppression of emery, uh, was transduced in change of transcription activity in the nucleus? Didn't do. We will do. Because this would be interesting to know. Totally right. Yeah, yeah. we are planning to do and we will do soon. Any other question? Then I go to the next section. Um, since lamina is sick and goes into the nucleus, into the nucleus and interact with lab to other part, in some cases, in extra as prescription factors, can your model catch also that interactions and are they take in consideration your distribution map? I didn't, but you're right, it could be. No, in our distribution map, we didn't take in consideration. Just we know that lap to alpha goes to the back. And we were surprised because homology between anything and lap to alpha is super high. Mm -hmm. So we were not expecting the two to work in this way. Our conclusion was that maybe there is a kind of flip flop. One is faster and has a stronger bound. So if all the bounding, if they fight for binding side, so one will uh, uh, saturate binding side, and the other one have to go where the first one didn't go. That is our idea, but as I told you, it's a minimal model. We know that there is much more than that. And just a very last question. Uh, you say that uh, this um, mutation in humans, uh, the, the major phenotype that you get is uh, a failure, correct? True. Uh, I mean, this uh, could be somehow related to the fact that uh, when you have an improper uh, function of uh, emery, uh, you are also impairing uh, the elastic properties of the cell, because that met matters a lot in the heart, but not in the skeletal mass. So, so yeah. uh, yes, totally agree. I would love to see. OK, let's go to the next round. Now. Very different. So up to now we talk about the fact that the cell is polarized and then this polarity is transmitted and so on. But now, as we know, in our body there is a, a plethora of different cell types. And what is cool is that they have very different size. Not only the size of the cell is different, but also the size of the nucleus is different. So that's raised the question, but how big is a nucleus? That seems a bit a silly question after all this picture fantastic in uh, uh, focal <laughs> stuff and so on. Another stuff that has been reported for years and still is used as um, uh, diagnosis marker is the fact that in cancer cell the nucleus not only have a weird shape but also is typically bigger. And uh, now all the people up to now think that uh, the uh, nuclear size or nuclear volume is regulated is just on the assumption that there is an osmotic equilibrium between uh, the cytoplasm and the nucleus. And these two elements, thanks to the existence of the nuclear pore, are osmotically connected. So if one suffers an osmotic perturbation, the other will react as well. And then the question is, 
how to measure the nuclear volume. And I say, of course, you can do 3D reconstruction with confocal and you got your volume. As we see in this day, and I insist a bit in the other lesson, X Y resolution of confocal respect X zeta resolution is not the same at all. The error that you do in zeta is much bigger. That's the first point. Second point, when you do 3D reconstruction, <coughs> you will make for sure a mistake. Second, you need many pictures to be acquired at different focal plane and then combine all together. That will take time and you will illuminate yourself a lot. The idea is how to develop a method that allows you to measure cell and nuclear volume in time with the cell that has kind of effective. As I told you also in the practical session, the first stuff that the cell stops to do when you acquire too many images and illuminate too much is the buy. While here we want to look at cell division. So, a few years ago, in a lab in Paris where I was postdoc, they developed this fantastic method to, 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 to measure um, cell volume. The idea is this one. So, you have a microfluidic chamber of uh, uh, no height. So, that is a small, small chamber, but you know how the chamber is uh, high. So, you know the height of the, of the chamber. And then you fulfill the chamber with uh, a fluorophore. In this case, okay, let's think it's dextran, red dextran. Now it's like the famous Pythagoras experiment with uh, the crown of the king. So if you put an object inside a liquid that is, uh, in this case, fluorescent, the object will take a space and the liquid cannot be there. So the space occupied by the cell, it will be dark. And so the cell, it will be visible inside this space because it will leave a dark area. Because where is the cell? It cannot be dextran. So the intensity of dextran that you look here is just less than if you have nothing. Because the cell is taking a space. The space taken by the cell cannot be fulfilled with dextran. So you have less dextran in this column. What I have to stress also a bit here, that this technique works uh, only with the cheap objective. So you go for low numerical aperture. That's why. You need a low numerical aperture because essentially you want to collect the light from all the field of view and for all the chamber. That means that you need a high deep of focus. That typically is not what you want when you do microscopy. So here we are using the shitty objective and just to make this possible. So low numerical aperture and low magnification. In this way, we are sure that we are integrating the signal all over the chamber. And when you see a decrease in the signal, that is because you have an object that is there. So now cells are black objects. And how much is black is proportional to the height of the cell. You can think that here you have the pillar. OK, the pillar is important, because if not, the roof will collapse. So it's like a building. If you don't put the pillar in the middle, the roof will collapse. To build a chamber like that is the same. You need pillar. If not, the roof will collapse. So then the pillars is used for calibration because the pillars is the zero. That is the tallest object that you can have in the chamber. Nothing can be taller than that. Not only this. Also, we know the height of the pillar because we know that the pillar is 18 micron. So what we say is an intensity that is low, like where we have the pillar, it corresponds to an object of 18 micron. An intensity that is maximal, where we have nothing, is zero. In this way, we can scale our image and go and hide for all the cells. Then we integrate the height over the cell area and we move from the A to the volume. So what's alpha and beta in the equation? Please. You have an alpha and a beta, it's like a linear equation. Uh, it's the calibration that we use. That okay. is the two parameters that we got from the calibration. Okay. So that is what we set, and that will give us alpha and beta. And then we use alpha and beta to calibrate the cell. And then, just to stress, not only you do that at each experiment, but we do that at each time frame. And we'll be more clear why we need to do also in the evolution of this technique. Because you can have fluctuation of the lamp or whatever that will make the intensity of the dextran just fluctuating. So that is why we need to calibrate each single frame. Not only, because that is the simple version of the technique. So if something is not clear, I go to the second step. It's fine. So then I told you, 
we don't want, so it's already done, we don't want to measure the cell volume, we want to measure the nuclear volume. So what we did, we, we make a second calibration. So now we can know the height of the cell times to the dextran, but then we fulfill the cell with another color, the GFP, that will go everywhere except the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So then we can calibrate the intensity of the GFP thanks to the already calibrated picture in red. And so we will know in any region except the nuclear one how tall is the cell, both from the red signal and for the green signal, and build a calibration proof that is done like that. So the intensity of the GFP signal is calibrated in function of the A that we just measured with the method before. In this way, we have a double calibration. One is done in the red, one is done in the green. Be careful, this calibration curve works only where you don't have the nucleus. So only pixel where there is no nucleus. Then you apply this calibration curve to everywhere. And now a portion of the volume will be missing. And the missing is exactly the volume of the nucleus. Because the two will not correspond only where you have another object. So it's a second negative calibration. And this allows us to measure the volume of the nucleus in the cell. We got the volume of the cell, the volume of the cytoplasm, we subtract one to the other, and we got the volume of the nucleus. So let's move from drawing to reality. That is a cell in our chamber. This is a beige to be. That is where we calibrate it. That is the dextran signal. So you see it's black where the cell is tall, and this less black reddish when the cell is small. And uh, this is what we calibrate, and we obtain this first calibration. This is the distribution of the GFP, and then we calibrate this one in function of this one, and we got this other one, and that is on the line that we have here. The two calibrations it correspond except where you have the nucleus, that is exactly the nuclear volume. And this is the, uh, an example of experimental calibration curve, mm -hmm. where we put the height computed with the dexon and the intensity of the GFP. Again, if you think that was important to calibrate each single frame when you have only the dextran, think as much as important to calibrate each single frame when you have the GFP, because then the GFP expression in the set can change over time. So again, also this calibration is done frame by frame, cell by cell. So each cell is self-calibrated and each frame is self-calibrated again. Auto test if we are totally wrong. So uh, what we did is that so there is this dumb particle that is particle very small that you can give the cell to it, and these uh, are um, spherical particles. So essentially, you can estimate the, um, the size of the particle thanks to the um, to the geometrical property. So from the radius, you got the volume essentially, and then we compare uh, the expected volume from the radius to our FXM measurement. And essentially, we found that there is a, a, a good correlation between the, um, the, the, the geometrical estimation of the volume of the particle and our measurement, and there is no kind of bias in one direction. Then, it's okay, that's what we have to do. We could not avoid. I told you before, just by confocal reconstruction, you can measure the nucleus, just it will take a lot of time, and you cannot do uh, a time lapse with it, but you can do. And the two methods, for the same population give similar distribution. Um, okay, that is a, a, a nicer scheme of the device. You have the cell inside the chamber, that is the pillar, that is side view, top view. And uh, okay, we test that we don't have to do too much the system, okay? Because as I told you, you insert one color for the, um, for the cytoplasm, one color for the nucleus, and then we want to be sure that uh, no one of the parameters is affected when we express H to B or the GFP. But now, how it look like in reality? So now, the red is the dextran, the black is the, uh, the pillars that sustain, and then all that is dextran, that is the cell, that is expressed with GFP and the nucleus. Now, you will be driven and you will look at that. Uh, but to be honest, uh, it's most cool this side here. So if you can, look at both. So as I told you, you can follow the cell over time, and then you can compute both cell volume and nuclear volume. The cell already divided one time. If I remember well, it will divide another time. So you can track the cell. Other cells divide. You see now divided again. 
So then you see that is a drop, drop, and going down again. So why insist that here is cool? Because this is a cell that is not suspected. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic of the technique. So as you see, you just see a shadow on the red, because that is the volume occupied by a cell. So the cell is not suspected, but it's there. So it occupies a volume in certain cells that is in the scene. So then that is the kind of measure that we can do. And this is the kind of cool that we got. So now, yesterday also we stressed about uh, the dimension, okay? So, and now here we can give dimension, thanks to the double calibration. So we know the volume of the cell in micrometer cube, and uh, we know the volume of the nucleus in micrometer cube. And that is just one example, but <coughs> again, the purpose of this technique is to do for as large number as possible, and indeed, then we repeat the experiment and we can track 99 difference at P1 cell line, at P1 cells. And then we got an average curve for the nucleus and an average curve for the, uh, for the cell. That is an interesting behavior that was already reported with the first version of the method, only the cell volume. It is called uh, methodic overshoot. So it looked like that when the cell just ran up, not only ran up, but also increased a bit abruptly its volume. And, uh, and that is just before cell division. But uh, as usual, you do for once a line, you don't stop, and you start to see if uh, different cell lines change. And we try to see if cancer, not cancer, plays a difference. I can tell you that we didn't find interesting stuff. So it seems that this behavior is quite common on different cell lines, either they are cancer or not cancer. And the kind of curve is almost the same. The amount of the overshoot can be variable, but uh, all, all of them are presented. And now we identify some point of interest. So we, we identify a, a point where you have the envelope breakdown, so when, uh, when the nucleus start to divide. And then we have to say that what's happening here, I would think, is not particularly sensitive. So I don't know if we can say a lot about this part here. But OK, here is where abruptly start to decrease. Here, <coughs> if after the um, nucleus expansion, that is a super fast phenomenon that happened uh, just after um, the reformation of the nucleus, the nucleus bump fast expanding in the first phase. And this is uh, the, the start of the overshoot. <coughs> so we call it nuclear envelope breakdown, uh, the first and the last is post mitotic expansion. And uh, the one in the middle is around that. Uh, so then uh, we um, try to understand if uh, uh, there is a correlation between uh, the, um, the start of the nuclear envelope breakdown, so when the nucleus start to uh, fast decrease, and the start of the overshoot. And we see that the typically nuclear envelope breakdown is one, two time frame before the start of the overshoot. So our time resolution is 10 minutes, and we found uh, a lag of one time frame. So I will not say that that is. I will not say that that's excluded that the two are not uh, uh, really at the same time. So we found it uh, and we report. Then there is correlation between the volume of the cell post mitotic expansion and uh, nuclear envelope breakdown. So it means that uh, um, if uh, if the cytoplasm was bigger before division, it will be bigger after after. And that is true for the cyto and for the nucleus. And then here, sorry, each color is a cell type, and this is the, the, the code. So it means bigger cell will have bigger total cell. And then we start to notice interesting stuff. So uh, we do the ratio between the nuclear envelope breakdown and post-methotic expansion. And then, as you can see, for the cytoplasm and then the nucleus, that uh, while for the cytoplasm is always 2, for the nucleus is not. So it looks like that the cell doubling and cut, but the nucleus is more than doubling. And that is particularly interesting. And uh, we also look at the nu uh, nuclear cytoplasmic volume ratio. And, um, and it's OK, it's reporting to a consequence of what you see here. So it's another way to look at sensor the same. So then, how fast they are growing? So now we move from um, average volume curve to grow curve. So the grow essentially is how much micrometer gain for hour. And we normalize in function of the volume. So essentially what we are doing here is asking ourselves, in function of the dimension of the cell at a, a particular time point, the cell with that size will grow more or less and the question that we want to answer is, is a bigger cell increasing more its volume 
That is what is called exponential growth. It means that if you are small, you grow up big. If you are big, you grow a lot. That the cell have an exponential growth was already been reported in the past. So essentially here, we confirm what was already reported. The point is that the nucleus doesn't. So the nucleus grow with a constant load. So this is an exponential growth, and this is constant. So it means that the nucleus, independently of its size, increase always of the same amount. So here take something that catch with our first assumption. As you remember, the first slide, or one of the first slides of this second part, was that cytoplasm and nucleus, they are in osmotic equilibrium. If the osmotic equilibrium is perfect, then these two curves have to follow the same rule. While here there is something strange. So if the osmotic equilibrium is there and the osmotic equilibrium is there, of course, but there is something more. So only osmotic equilibrium is not sufficient to explain this phenotype. So here means that the two are not always in equilibrium or the equilibrium somehow changed during time. If you look at the curve like that, it looks like that the, the nucleus doesn't grow and the cell grow a lot. But then you have to think that the nucleus is smaller and the cell is bigger. So if you put them in the same scale, it's okay. It looks like the nucleus doesn't grow. In the reality, if you normalize for their side, the nucleus grow much more than the cell. And that is why you also the point that the cell is just doubling and the nucleus is more than that. But then just like before, we didn't do for one cell, we test this behavior, and the behavior is always the, the same, also for different cell lines. The game is always the same. But then, we know that the nucleus, again, is connected to the cytoskeleton, because this is my family talk. And uh, what has been reported recently is that the tension from the cytoskeleton is transmitted to the nuclear angle, and this can affect different protein, and among them, also size and function. <coughs> so, what we decided to test is, it's possible to correlate our observation with the tension exerted by the cytoskeleton to the nuclear envelope. And to do that, we build this uh, um, nuclear envelope FRET sensor. So we never introduced FRET in this uh, course, this here. So FRET essentially is a property of fluorophore that if they are close enough, instead to be excited and emitted, they can be excited, but the emission is captured immediately by the fluorophore that is close by, and then will be emitted at a different wavelength. So essentially, we uh, excite uh, the, the cerulean, and we start to read the emission of the cerulean, we go to read the emission of the Venus. That is a bit far away. So if these two proteins are very, very close, then it means that uh, there is a lot of this FRAC signal. If they are far away, there is less of this signal. <coughs> Far and close is the original uh, version of this spread sensor. So essentially, it's like um, uh, so when, when they are close, then low tension are close. You increase the tension, they go far away, and you have less spread. So this is the way how old version of this construct has been done. But now there is a, a modern version that doesn't go for distance, but it works on the orientation in the reality. So in the center of the sensor, the two fluorophore are um, uh, one close to the other again, but what matters is not the distance, because that cannot change, it's the orientation. So then when there is tension on the two other side, what will happen is that the tip will be bent and the efficiency of red will decrease. It's been reported that maybe they are more sensitive, and it looks the case, I have to say. So as I told you, the nice print had a part of the domain, the cash domain that stay on the nuclear envelope, that is this size that's bound to the, to the sun protein on the nuclear envelope, while the other part binds to actin. So then you have this one that stay at the nuclear envelope, this one that binds to actin, and then we use as a control, because then we produce exactly the same sensor, but only with the binding on the, uh, on the, on the nuclear envelope. So in this case, we see bam, a decrease of the fat signal because I sense it, it could not be intention. Because this side will never bind to actin, and so there is nothing that can pull. So that is our control. And then we went to measure on different conditions. So um, we measure 
cytoplasmic and nuclear volume in, uh, in contron cells, in cells that are being detached. Y compound is uh, a drug that will decrease contractility of the cell, a trunk will affect acting, and hyperosmotic shock essentially it will uh, make the cell shrink. It's an osmotic shock. What we notice, okay, about the volume of the cytoplasm is more or less what we expect, but uh, for the ones on the nucleus, all of this treatment will, uh, um, will induce a decrease on nuclear volume. I want to stress a concept here. So I told you that there is something wrong on the osmotic coupling, but the osmotic coupling is dead. When you do an osmotic shock to the cell and the cell shrink, the nucleus shrink too. You just notice that there is something more, but the osmotic coupling is still there. The two objects are in osmotic equilibrium. Does this equilibrium have to change? The other stuff that we notice, it's okay. Then we can measure also the nuclear end of tension. And the hyperosmotic shock doesn't seem to affect, but all the other affect it. So if you detach the cell, of course, the cell has any more acid straight, so it cannot pull on the on nuclear end, and so the tension decreases. If you, uh, uh, if you need myosin, of course, they cannot pull. And uh, if you affect uh, actin, also, they have a problem to pull. But to try to understand a bit better, we move from static experiments to dynamic experiments. Because, again, one of the great advantages of our technique is that we can look at the cell while they are dying and while they are growing. So we move from static experiment to dynamic experiment. And here we focus in three experiments. So an hyperosmotic shock, a detachment, and a spreading. Detachment and spreading is just one the boundary of the other. So in, uh, in detachment, the cell is adhered, and then with detachment, the other, it will spread. And here we focus only in uh, cytovolume, nuclear volume, and nuclear envelope tension. That is the three properties that we are going to measure. The simple one is the hyperosmotic shock. So as expected, the cell shrink. Not only the cell shrink, but if you normalize, the shrink and the same ratio. So the two, again, are osmotically focused. Not only both shrink, but how much one shrink, the other one shrink too. So they are hypothetically coupled. One affects the other, and also we were, okay, let's say I cannot exclude, okay? At the time resolution of my experiment, that in this case is two minutes, the two go down at the same time. Maybe if we increase the time resolution, we can see a possible lag, I don't know. At the time resolution we did, the two go together. Then we did the detachment. So on the detachment, we just use strips in the cell with detach. And uh, uh, what we measure is that the cytovolume maybe doesn't change a lot, and the nuclear volume goes a bit down. And what is going down to is the nuclear envelope tension. So in this case, nuclear volumes go down, nuclear envelope tension go down too. Then we do the contrary on the spreading. The spreading is interesting. On the spreading, we see that while the cell is spreading on the substrate, the nuclear volume increase. The cytoplasmic volume slightly decrease, and that has been reported also from other labs, and that is kind of interesting. While the cell is spreading on the substrate, also nuclear envelope tension increases. So we can summarize. When the volume of the cell goes down, the volume of the nucleus goes down, and the tension doesn't change. And that's it, the hypodermotor shock. And the detachment is interesting because the two are not coherent anymore. So it means, again, there is something more. Because the volume of the cell increases, the one of the nucleus decreases, and the tension decreases now. When we do exactly the contrary of spreading, the volume of the cell goes down, the one of the nucleus goes up, again, are not coherent. But in this case, the tension goes up. So what we notice here now is that we don't know well, okay, the two are osmotically coupled and that's no doubt. But then the volume of the nucleus is always current with the tension of the nuclear angle. So there is a strong connection between how the volume of the nucleus behaves and which is the tension exerted by the cytoskeleton on the nuclear angle. We did a final experiment with suggestion of Alexandro Marcello because I called him and I asked something like, but how I can stop nuclear core? And he told me, but you know, you can use ivermectin. 
So then what we did is exactly the same experiment than before. So we let the cells spread. As we see, the volume of the, of the cytoplasm mm -hmm. goes down. The tension on the nuclear envelope increased. But this time, the volume of the nucleus doesn't manage to increase. So our conclusion is that uh, the tension exerted on the nuclear envelope will affect somehow how the permeability of the nucleus is set. And that is where the osmotic coupling is broken. Because the permeability of the nucleus is not always the same, but instead is function of the tension exerted by the cytoskeleton on the nuclear envelope. So again, this is the conclusion that we are from now. So first, Ultraf the two are osmotic coupling, so there is an osmotic coupling between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, they don't grow in the same loop. One is exponential and the other is constant. The second one, the, the, the tension bias nuclear input, so somehow the tension exerted in the nuclear input will bias the permeability of the nucleus. Permeability is the wrong thing. I know that I should not say permeability, but it gives you the idea. So if I pull on the membrane, the amount of protein that can enter is higher. It's wrong to say permeability because permeability would mean that works in both directions, and that is not true. So the amount of protein that can enter in the nucleus is probably a function of the nuclear Thanks God we are not the only one to say that, but there are uh, Pererocca, Kusha, that is published in a couple of papers, and also there is a couple of papers for um, structural biologists that also confirm this hypothesis. Then what we did too, we measured the nuclear envelope tension and uh, together with that we measured the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio of uh, a very simple reporter like GFPNLS. And here the idea is, if it's true that uh, in somehow nuclear envelope tension drives the possibility of an LS protein to enter more in the nucleus, this ratio should change and more or less is what we found. So essentially now we modify the original model of the poor osmocoupling and we put another element in, in the model that is sigma here. So the tension, again, sorry if I repeat always the same, the tension exerted on the cytos from the cytoskeleton on the nuclear angle that somehow affects how much protein can enter in the nucleus. So for both the, so first, the, the, the first story that I told you was mainly done by uh, Paulina, was a post postdoc in the lab. And the story on the volume is done by Fabrizio Paulina, who is a biologist, Fabrizio is an, an engineer. And for both work, um, nuclear quality and nuclear volume, uh, Marco Cosentino and Marcino team help us with uh, the mathematical and physical theory. And for fabrication, Aldo Ferrari and Francesca Pomotto. And that is the founder. So, thank you.